Hello and welcome to this webcast on IFRS 17 Insurance Contracts. Today we'll be providing a basic overview on measuring insurance contracts that have participation and other features. My name is Laura Kennedy and I'm an Assistant Technical Manager on the Insurance Contracts project. My name is Anne McGeechan and I'm a Technical Principal on the Insurance Contracts project. Before we start, as usual, the views expressed in this presentation are our own and not necessarily those of the International Accounting Standards Board or of the IFRS Foundation. We have previously published other webcasts on IFRS 17. To see a full list of all the IFRS 17 webcasts, please see the appendix that accompany the slides for this webcast. This webcast on insurance contracts with participation and other features will be in two parts. You are listening to part one. In part one, we will outline four features that are included in some insurance contracts and will explain the effect of those four features on the measurement of the fulfillment cash flows. The four features we'll be discussing today are payments to policyholders that vary with returns on underlying items through participation features, financial options and guarantees, discretion over timing or amount of cash flows, and cash flows affecting other contracts. In part two, we'll move on to discuss the effect of these four features on the contractual service margin. Let's start with a reminder of the requirements of IFRS 17. Under the IFRS 17 core requirements, insurance contracts are measured at the sum of two components, the fulfillment cash flows and the contractual service margin. The first component, the fulfillment cash flows, comprises estimates of the net future cash flows. These estimates are the probability weighted average of all the possible outcomes. The estimates of the cash flows also reflect financial risk and the time value of money. The probability weighted cash flows are brought into present value terms. Additionally, fulfillment cash flows reflect non-financial risk because an adjustment for non-financial risk, called the risk adjustment, is added to the estimate of the cash flows. This webcast will discuss how the four features set out on the previous slide affect the measurement of the fulfillment cash flows. A webcast titled Core Requirements – Measurement Essentials of IFRS 17 is available on our website which provides background information. We recommend that you view that webcast before viewing today's webcast. A contract is an agreement between two or more parties that creates enforceable rights and obligations. Enforceability of the rights and obligations in a contract is a matter of law. An entity shall consider its substantive rights and obligations, whether they arise from a contract, law or regulation, when applying IFRS 17, including determining whether a contract has the features discussed in this webcast and if so, to what extent. But an entity shall disregard terms that have no commercial substance, i.e. no discernible effect on the economics of the contract. This applies when an entity considers how to classify a contract and when, when assessing the substantive rights and obligations for determining the cash flows in the boundary of a contract. Contracts can be written, oral or implied by an entity's customary business practice. The practices and processes for establishing contracts with customers vary across legal jurisdictions, industries and entities. In addition, they may vary within an entity. For example, they may depend on the class of customer or the nature of the promised goods or services. Let's now move to the first of the four features, participation. For each feature, we will provide a basic overview of the feature and then explain its effect on the measurement of the fulfillment cash flows. Payments to policyholders may vary with the returns on underlying items through participation features. 
Underlying items can comprise any items. For example, a reference portfolio of assets, the net assets of the entity, or a specified subset of the net assets of the entity. An insurance contract with participation features may also have any of the other three features we will be discussing in this webcast. Financial options and guarantees, discretionary cash flows, and cash flows that affect other contracts. We will discuss those three features later on in this webcast. IFRS 17 does not treat all insurance contracts with participation features in the same way. It uses the idea of direct participation features to determine the accounting treatment for insurance contracts. Contracts that have direct participation features, as defined in IFRS 17, have specific requirements. Those specific requirements are called the variable fee approach in this, web, in this webcast. Contracts without direct participation features apply the IFRS 17 core requirements. We explain the similarities and differences in the requirements applicable to contracts with and without direct participation features in the next slide. The only difference in the requirements applicable to contracts with and without direct participation features is the subsequent measurement of the contractual service margin. Part 2 of this webcast discusses those different requirements and also the criteria for identifying contracts with direct participation features. The requirements for the fulfilment cash flows for contracts with and without direct participation features are the same. Accordingly, this webcast is applicable for both contracts with and without direct participation features. When measuring the fulfilment cash flows, specifically the estimates of future cash flows, the entity will need to reflect the extent to which cash flows vary with returns on underlying items. Sometimes the underlying items are financial underlying items. So cash flows that vary based on the returns on such underlying items should be discounted at rates that reflect that variability. In other words, the discount rate should reflect the dependence on financial underlying items or adjusted for the effect of the variability and discounted at a rate that reflects that adjustment. When measuring the cash flows that vary with returns on financial underlying items, it is important to remember that IFRS 17 requires estimates of market variables to be consistent with observable market prices at the reporting date. Now let's look at the other three features which may also be part of insurance contracts with participation features. The second feature that some contracts with participation features may have is the presence of financial options and guarantees. Financial options and guarantees limit or alter the extent of policyholders' participation in the return of underlying items. One example would be a policyholder's right to change a financial benefit to another type of benefit under potentially favourable terms. Or, another example would be variable cash flows to the policyholder based on underlying items that are subject to a guaranteed minimum annual return. As a reminder, an entity would need to determine whether the embedded financial options and guarantees should be separated and accounted for applying IFRS 9 financial instruments. If the embedded derivatives are not separated, an entity shall then account for those derivatives as part of the insurance contract applying IFRS 17. An entity must consider the effect of the financial options and guarantees not separated from an insurance contract when measuring the fulfilment cash flows. The measurement approach in IFRS 17 will result in the present value of future cash flows reflecting the current value of options and guarantees consistent with observable market variables.
To the extent that those options and guarantees are not separated from the insurance contract, the expected present value of future cash flows is an estimate based on all possible outcomes about cash flows. IFRS 17 also requires the measurement to include the effect of financial risk, either in the estimates of future cash flows or in the discount rate. The measurement approach in IFRS 17 therefore incorporates both the intrinsic value and the time value of embedded options and guarantees. IFRS 17 does not specify the technique to be applied to measure these embedded options and guarantees. An entity will need to exercise judgment to determine the appropriate technique that will meet the objective for the measurement of those options and guarantees. An example of a technique that could be particularly useful for contracts with embedded options and guarantees could be stochastic modelling. Let's now look at the third feature, discretion. The third feature discussed in this webcast is discretionary cash flows. In some cases, an insurance contract gives the entity discretion over the payments to the policyholders, either in their timing or in their amount or both. Such discretion is often subject to some constraint, including constraints in law or regulation or market competition. For example, the entity may vary the extent to which policyholders participate in the returns from underlying items, or may vary the timing of payments of the policyholders' share of returns through bonus mechanisms. IFRS 17 requires an entity to determine an insurance contract boundary by considering the substantive rights and obligations created by the contract. Once the contract boundary has been determined, IFRS 17 then requires the measurement of a group of insurance contracts to include an unbiased estimate of all the expected cash flows within the contract boundaries of the contracts in the group. Those expected cash flows include those that are at the discretion of the entity. The contract boundary establishes the existence and extent of the contract liability and the unbiased estimate of all the expected cash flows, regardless of whether they are enforceable, determines the measurement of the group of contracts. Now let's move on to the fourth feature. Some insurance contracts affect the cash flows to policyholders of other contracts. This effect is sometimes called mutualisation. However, that term is used in practice to refer to a variety of effects, and so the term mutualisation is not used in IFRS 17 or in this webcast. In these contracts, the substantive rights and obligations of a contract provide the policyholder the right to share the returns on a specified pool of underlying items with other policyholders and the obligation to bear a reduction in their share of the return because of guaranteed payments to other policyholders. Sometimes this effect happens between contracts in different groups. When this occurs, IFRS 17 specified, specifies how it affects the determination of the fulfilment cash flows of the groups. What is the effect of this feature on the measurement of the fulfilment cash flows on the groups of contracts affected? The measurement of present value of future cash flows should reflect the extent to which contracts in the group cause the entity to be affected by expected cash flows to policyholders in that group or to policyholders in another group. We discuss this further in the next slides. So, the fulfilment cash flows for a group a. include payments arising from the terms of existing contracts, even if those payments are expected to be made to policyholders of contracts in other groups, and b. exclude payments to policyholders in the group that, applying a above, have been included in the fulfilment cash flows of another group.
There is a simplified example in Appendix B to these slides to illustrate this concept. The example uses simplified facts to clearly illustrate this IFRS 17 requirement only. Sometimes the expected payments to policyholders of contracts in other groups are to expected future policyholders. The terms of an existing contract may be such that the entity is obliged to pay to policyholders amounts based on underlying items, but with discretion over the timing of the payments. That means that some of the amounts based on underlying items may be expected to be paid to policyholders of contracts that are expected to be issued in the future, rather than to existing policyholders. From the entity's perspective, the terms of the existing contract require it to pay the amounts, even though it does not yet know when or to whom it will make the payments. IFRS 17 does not mandate the approach to be used to determine the fulfilment cash flows of groups of contracts that, aff that affect or are affected by cash flows to policyholders of contracts in other groups. Different practical approaches can be used. In some cases, an entity may be able to identify the change in the underlying items and resulting change in the cash flows only at a higher level of aggregation than the groups. In such cases, the entity shall allocate the effect of the change in the underlying items to each group on a systematic and rational basis. After all the coverage has been provided to the contracts in the group, the fulfilment cash flows may still include payments expected to be made to current policyholders in other groups or future policyholders. An entity is not required to continue to allocate such fulfilment cash flows to specific groups, but can instead recognise and measure a liability for such fulfilment cash flows arising from all groups. The fulfilment cash flows are the sum of the present value of probability weighted expected cash flows, which reflect financial risk, and an explicit risk adjustment for non-financial risk, such as insurance risk. The previous slides discuss the effect of the four features on the present value of future cash flows. This slide is a reminder that the entity will need to consider whether these four features could have an effect on the measurement of the risk adjustment for non-financial risk. As a reminder, the risk adjustment is the compensation an entity requires for bearing the uncertainty about the amount and timing of the cash flows that arises from non-financial risk. That's the end of part one of this webcast on measuring insurance contracts with participation and other features. We have provided a basic overview of the four features shown on this slide, and we've discussed the effect of those features on the measurement of the fulfillment cash flows. In part two, we'll discuss the effect of those features on the contractual service margin. Thank you for listening to part one. Thank you and goodbye.